a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Saul, still breathing murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus that if he should find any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. On his journey, as he was nearing Damascus, a light from the sky suddenly flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, Who are you, sir? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, for they heard the voice but could see no one. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. For three days he was unable to see, and he neither ate nor drank. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and ask at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is there praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, that he may regain his sight. But Ananias replied, Lord, I have heard from many sources about this man, what evil things he has done to your holy ones in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to imprison all who call upon your name. The Lord said to him, Go, for this man is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel and I will show him what he will have to suffer for my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. Laying his hands on him, he said, Saul, my brother, the Lord has sent me. Jesus, who appeared to you on the way by which you came, that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, things like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. He got up and was baptized, and when he had eaten, he recovered his strength. He stayed some days with the disciples in Damascus, and he began at once to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. The word of the Lord. Go out to all the world and tell the good news. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Glorify him, all you peoples. Go out to all the world and tell For steadfast is his kindness toward us, and the fidelity of the Lord endures forever. Dominus vobiscus, et Evangelii secundum, Ioanne. Gloria 
The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. These things he said while teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. Verbum Domini. In the first reading from Acts today, we read about the sudden revelation of Jesus to Paul, or to Saul, also called Paul, and we see Paul's subsequent conversion. And when reflecting upon this account, we often like to highlight, of course, its extraordinary character, especially how Paul changes from being a zealous enemy and persecutor of the church to one of the greatest apostles and evangelizers of all time. However, I thought that today I would focus on a different element in the story. It seems that there is one person in this account who usually doesn't get enough attention, the disciple Ananias. While there are several men named Ananias in the book of Acts, this particular Ananias is only recounted in this one paragraph from Acts. And there's a brief mention later in Acts when Paul gives his account of his conversion. Yet from this one paragraph, we can conclude that Ananias played an instrumental role in St. Paul's conversion. Ananias was a brother and a friend to a known enemy of the church and he truly loved his enemy as a brother. Imagine being in the shoes of Ananias when you receive a vision and hear the Lord tell you to go and to seek out Paul at the, man, at the house of a man named Judas. Now Ananias had likely remained in hiding himself for fear of being captured and put to death by Paul. He had obviously heard the news from other Christians about Paul's brutality and the other, his utter lack of mercy and sympathy towards Christians. The situation would have been comparable to a person in Germany hiding Jews during World War II and being told that they must go and seek out an SS officer. And Ananias has no knowledge of the vision that the Lord had given to Paul. He has no knowledge about this, just what the Lord tells him. And so he must take the Lord at his word. And he at first seems to be hesitant. You know, he first seems to protest as he reminds the Lord of Paul's reputation of violence against Christians. And when the Lord reassures Ananias that Paul is a chosen instrument to bring the name of Jesus before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, Ananias is faced with a choice. He can either give in to fear and disregard the Lord's command, which would, of course, carry some serious consequences for himself and for his faith, or he can take the Lord at his word and go to seek out Paul. Ananias would have had every reason to fear and even to despise Paul. You know, perhaps Paul had some, some of Ananias' own family and friends killed or captured. 
Instead, Ananias is moved by his love for the Lord, and he decides to trust in the Lord's word. He believes that the Lord will not lead him into danger, and he moves forward in faith. And while it is true that Paul is going to be the Lord's chosen instrument for proclaiming the gospel to the nations, Ananias is also a chosen instrument of the Lord. Ananias is the Lord's chosen instrument to be an apostle to Paul and also his friend and his brother. Ananias must now see in Paul not merely a murderous enemy of the church, but a brother in Christ. In fact, when Ananias goes to see Paul, he explicitly calls Paul his brother before Paul is even baptized. He says to him, Saul, my brother, the Lord has sent me, Jesus, who appeared to you on the way by which you came, that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Thus, Ananias shows great kindness, graciousness, and generosity towards this man who, until recently, had some Christians killed and leveled threats against others. Ananias truly loves his enemy and prays for one who has persecuted him and his brothers and sisters in Christ. Ananias is the Lord's chosen instrument. Through him, Paul experiences God's love, mercy, and healing. And after spending several days with the disciples, Paul sets out and begins his own public ministry thanks to the Christ-like witness of Ananias. This account of the relationship between Ananias and Paul helps to illustrate a teaching that has long been part of the tradition of Catholic social teaching, that is the concept of universal brotherhood. This teaching is built upon the foundation of the dignity of every human person, all of whom are created in the image and likeness of God. And Pope Francis highlights this teaching of universal brotherhood in his encyclical Fratelli Tutti, Brothers and Sisters All. The Holy Father says, the church has a public role over and above her charitable and educational activities. She works for the advancement of humanity and of universal fraternity. She does not claim to compete with earthly powers, but to offer herself as a family among families. This is the church open to bearing witness in today's world, open to faith, hope, and love for the Lord, and for those whom he loves with a preferential love. A home with open doors. The church is a home with open doors because she is a mother. Now there may be some who think that the idea of universal brotherhood is something that was taken from the Freemasons or is something that some, some liberal thing that Pope Francis just cooked up himself. Well, here is a, a paragraph from the Catholic social teaching from the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church. This is paragraph 145, and this compendium came out in 2004, before Pope Francis. Together with equality in the recognition of the dignity of each person and of every people, there must also be an awareness that it will be possible to safeguard and promote human dignity only if this is done as a community, by the whole of humanity. Only through the mutual action of individuals and peoples sincerely concerned for the good of all men and women can a genuine universal brotherhood be attained. Otherwise, the persistence of conditions of serious disparity and inequality will make us all poorer. And also from the Second Vatican Council document, Gaudium et Spes, it says in number 24, God who has fatherly concern for everyone has willed that all men should constitute one family and treat one another in a spirit of brotherhood. For having been created in the image of God, who from one man has created the whole human race, 
and made them live over the face of the earth, all men are called to one and the same goal, namely God himself. Now, if anyone thinks that universal brotherhood is merely an invention of the Second Vatican Council, Pope Pius XI says in his encyclical in 1922, Ubi Arcano Dei Concilio, which was before Vatican II, quote, patriotism, the stimulus of so many virtues and of so many noble acts of heroism, when kept within the bounds of the law of Christ, becomes merely an occasion, an added incentive to grave injustice, when true love of country is debased to the condition of an extreme nationalism, when we, when we forget that all men are our brothers and members of the same great human family, that other nations have an equal right with us both to life and to prosperity. And for good measure, here's one more pope, from before Vatican II, Pope Leo XIII, who says in 1891 in his encyclical Reum Novarum, quote, if Christian precepts prevail, the two classes, he's talking about the rich and the poor, will not only be united in the bonds of friendship, but also those of brotherly love. For they will understand and feel that all men are the children of the common father, that is, of God that all have the same end, which is God himself, who alone can make either men or angels absolutely and perfectly happy, that all and each are redeemed by Jesus Christ and raised the dignity of children of God and are thus united in brotherly ties, both with each other and with Jesus Christ, the firstborn among many brethren. The fact is that Ananias, loved Paul as a brother, even before Paul became a member of the church. It is this kind of universal brotherly love that we are called to have for all men and women so that we can enter into a fruitful dialogue and, and guide one another closer to the truth and ultimately to Jesus Christ, truth himself. If we love the members of our own immediate family, and I hope that we all do. How much more are we called to love the members of our universal family? As Jesus himself says in Luke's gospel, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he is kind to the ungrateful and the selfish. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. Christians are called to set themselves apart from selfishness and from lack of love for their neighbor. They are called to be brothers and sisters to all and to love all people and not merely those who are already Christian or members of their own families. The call to love is universal because all people are ultimately children of the Father in heaven and our call to be united in Jesus Christ, our Lord. People need to encounter the love of Christ through Christians, as St. Paul encountered Christ's love through the humble disciple Ananias.